not let them sit. As soon as they are, they are on their seat, we should call the national anthem. May we have the national anthem followed by the university anthem.
I hereby establish the protocol for the 13th Convocation Lecture, installation of the Chancellor, conferment of honorary degrees of honorary Doctor of Science, honoris causa, on the Chancellor, and admission to force degrees, special direct entry student as follows. The promoter, His Excellency Chief Olusiagun Obasanjo, GCFR, PhD. The guest lecturer, Professor Egosa Osage. The chairman of the occasion, who is the president and chairman of the Board of Trustees, represented by the Pro Chancellor and Chairman of Council, Professor Bart Najin. The Executive Secretary, National Universities Commission, members of the Board of Trustees, present and past. The Chancellor designate, the Pro Chancellor and Chairman of Council, members of the Governing Council, present and past, the Registrar, Jump Admissions and Matriculation Board, the Secretary General, Association of Vice Chancellors of Nigerian Universities, the Chairman, Committee of Vice Chancellors and Registrars of Private Universities in Nigeria, Royal Fathers, my Lord, spiritual and temporal, VC Vice Chancellors and Registrars, Vice Chancellor of Bell's University of Technology, Otta, Principal Officers of Bell's University of Technology, present and past, members of Senate, Chairman and members of Bell's University Parent Forum, graduates, distinguished invited guests, gentlemen of the press, staff and students, Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, permit me at this juncture to welcome the Vice Chancellor of our great university as he gives his welcome address, Professor Jeremiah Oludele Ojedero. A round of applause for him, please, as he comes up. Please permit me to stand on the already established protocol. The registrar has done a good job of that. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I have the to specially welcome you all to the 13th Convocation Lecture of Bell's University of Technology, OTA, holding today, Friday, 5th November, 2021. On behalf of the promoter, the president, and chairman, and members of the board of sources, the pro chancellor and chairman of council, and other members of council, senate, management, staff, and students of Bell University of Technology, Ota, I deeply appreciate your celebrating this unique event with us. The ivory towers and the eggheads. Over time, ladies and gentlemen, the university has been identified as the melting pot for ideas and ideals on which society had thrived. But we were misunderstood and misconstrued as living in our ivory towers because of the erroneous initial belief that we were recluse and have the privileged seclusion or separation from the facts and practicalities of the real world. We were once called eggheads to refer to us as intellectuals who were out of touch with the ordinary people. But over time, our ideas, ideals, postulations, and solutions proffered are turned out to be game changers and the pivot 
upon which revolutions and paradigms, paradigm changes have been hinged. The ivory tower and the occupants had over time come up with innovations which made life better for the common man. It is therefore instructive that the, at the cost of every industrial revolution and transition in human development, there will always be input from these same eggheads. This is a proof that our postulations are germane to the development of the societies. It is in the light of the above that I strongly believe that today's lecture will leave its indel indelible mark in the sand of time. How that will be, the guest lecturer will take us through that. It is worthy of note that academic encounters as today were always controversial and most times deep insights and solutions are preferred to existing social maladies and problems. And if and when taken, the ripples caused lead to the desired changes in the scheme of things, especially in styles and ideals of governance. Today's lecture, ladies and gentlemen, today's lecture and the lecturer could not have been more apt, especially at a time like this, in the light of the facts enumerated above. May I, may I dear distinguished guests, especially appreciate and welcome our guest convocation lecturer, former vice chancellor, Ibinadio University, Edo State, and current director general, Nigeria Institute of International Affairs, Lagos. A well-rounded fellow, erudite scholar of note, and a voice to be listened to. And I singularly mention, with due respect, Professor Eosa Osage. Thank you. We are delighted to have you in our midst to deliver the 13th Convocation Lecture titled, Making Science a Paradigm for Development, the Perspective of Science Diplomacy. Also, we appreciate you for coming on board and identifying with us. Let me reiterate to our eminent guests that our mission statement at Bell Tech is to discover, disseminate, and apply the knowledge of science and engineering for human well-being and the development of the society. Hence, today's lecture falls within the ambience of our core mandate. So, I will charge us all to listen and learn from the experience of our convocation lecturer. In closing, please permit me to stand on the established protocol and appreciate all our fathers and foundation builders, and especially the foundation vice chancellor of this university, Emeritus Professor Julius Okoji. We deeply and humbly appreciate you all. And thank you for your great support and for providing this veritable platform on which we all stand today. Let me also especially appreciate all of our special guests for identifying with us today. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you all and thank you for your audience. Thank you, sir.
Thank you very much. May I welcome the Pro Chancellor, Professor Bart Naji, representing the President Board of Trustees as he comes to give the Chairman's opening remarks. Good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I stand on already established protocol. Uh, what I'm going to read is the voice of the president of the university. Uh, so it is my pleasure on behalf of the Board of Trustees to welcome you all to the 13th Convocation Lecture of Bell's University of Technology Ota, taking place today, 5th November, 2021. I wish to sincerely welcome His Excellency, Chief Olusegun Obasanjo, for honoring us with his esteemed presence. He hasn't gotten here, so, uh, but nonetheless, we welcome him. I warmly welcome the Chancellor designate, His Excellency, Al Haji Dr. Ibrahim <laughs> of Gombe State. And I appreciate him for doing us proud by accepting to come on board to con contribute to the orderly growth and development of this university. We are indeed grateful. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, permit me to also appreciate the Pro Chancellor. Professor Bart Naji, members of, of the Board of Trustees and Council for their great support and remarkable contributions to the growth and development of the university. I also appreciate the Vice Chancellor, Professor Jeremiah Oludele Ojedira, members of Senate traditional rulers, Vice Chancellors and Registrars of other universities members of the Bells University Parents Forum, distinguished guests, media executives, staff, and students of Bells University of Technology. May I especially welcome and thank our distinguished guest lecturer, Professor Egosa Osage, Director General of the Nigerian Institute of International Af Affairs and former Vice Chancellor, Igbenedin University, Okada. I thank you most sincerely for honoring us in this unique way by personally delivering the 13th Convocation Lecture titled, quote, Making Science a Paradigm for Development, the Perspective of Science Diplomacy. We are very proud to be identified with you. Through this lecture, you have Im immensely contributed to knowledge and your name will be written in gold in the annals of this university. May I, at this juncture, express the university's appreciation to all those who have supported and contributed to the remarkable achievements recorded over the years. We cannot but express gratitude to the promoter, Chief Olusegun Obasanjo, GCFR, PhD, and all the founding members, founding fathers of this university. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, once again, on behalf of the Board of Trustees and Governing Council, I thank you for honoring our invitation. Thank you and God bless. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Once again, may I welcome 
the Pro Chancellor, Chairman of Council, Professor Bart Naji, to come up and give his goodwill message. Now, this is really my voice. <laughs> I also stand on existing protocol. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you all to the 13th Convocation Lecture of Bell's University of Technology, Otter, holding today, 5th November 2021. I most respectfully welcome His Excellency, Chief Olusegun Obasanjo for honoring us with his esteemed presence. The promoter has been a pillar of support to the sustainable growth and development of this university. Sir, indeed, we are grateful. I especially welcome and congratulate His Excellency Alhaji Dr. Ibrahim Hassan Dankwambo former executive governor of Gombe State. You're welcome, sir. Who will be installed today as the third chancellor of Bell's University of Technology, Otta? We look forward to benefiting from your wealth of experience. My profound gratitude also goes to members of the Board of Trustees and the Governing Council of Bell's University of Technology, Otta, for their unceasing support towards the growth and development of this great institution. I welcome and appreciate the Vice Chancellor, Professor Jeremiah Oludele Ojedirong, members of Senate, staff and students of Bell's University of Technology, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, may I at this juncture re request that we rise to observe a one-minute silence in honor of our immediate past president and chairman of the Board of Trustees, late Reverend Dr. Wilson Badejo, who passed on to glory on Saturday, 7th August 2021, and also the immediate past chancellor, Alhaji Ahmad Joda who passed on on Monday, 16th August, 2021. May we rise, please. May the souls of the departed rest in peace. Amen. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me on behalf of the Governing Council welcome our guest lecturer, Professor Esoga Osage, Director General, Nigerian Institute of International Affairs, and former Vice Chancellor, Ibnedion University of Kada, Edo State. I thank you most sincerely for honoring us in this unique way by accepting to deliver the 13th Convocation Lecture titled, Making Science a Paradigm for Development, the Perspective of Science Diplomacy. This resonates with the mission of Bell's University of Technology to discover, disseminate, and apply the knowledge of science and engineering for human well-being and development of the society. Our erudite guest lecturer, Professor Egosa Osage, would do justice to this topic of the day. Being an icon and authority in this field, through this lecture, I am very confident that this, our distinguished audience will further appreciate the importance of science and technology in the socioeconomic development of our dear nation. I sincerely welcome and appreciate our distinguished academic, academics and vice chancellors of other universities members of Bell's University Parents Forum, media executives, and other distinguished guests. 
May I conclude by calling on our distinguished guests and well wishes to continue to support the university in our quest towards achieving distinction and academic excellence. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, once again, I welcome you to this memorable occasion and thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Before we take the, the citation, uh, let me uh, recognize the presence of uh, the following uh, personalities. Major General A.K. Kwashebe, retired, Kumbi State PDP Chairman, is here present with us. <laughs> Alaji Mohammed Jibrin Bade is here with us. All local government party chairman, chairman all local government party chairmen and other stakeholders. They are also here. <laughs> Professor Inigwe Olubukola, representing the president of the Global Initiative Center for Science Research and Development, is also here. Thank you very much, sir. To read the citation of the guest speaker, I welcome the chairman, ceremonials committee, Dr. Caroline Anyakora. Thank you. Standing on existing protocol, I humbly request the guest lecturer to stand up for his citation. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, permit me to read the citation of the guest lecturer, Professor Eosa Osagai. Eosa Emmanuel Osagai holds a PhD in political science from the University of Ibadan, 1986, where he is a professor of political science. He was appointed director general of the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs by the president and commander in chief of the Federal Republic of Nigeria in March, 2021 and was most recently Vice Chancellor of Ibunedion University, Okada, a position he held for a record 14 years, from 2004 to 2018. <laughs> Professor Osagai was the 2019 Claudette Chair at Uppsala University and Nordic Africa Institute, Sweden and a fellow of the Stellenbosch Institute of Advanced Studies in South Africa. He was the 2017 Van Zyl Sklabati Professor of Politics and Sociology at the University of Cape Town and the 2014 Emeka Anyon Kunche of Commonwealth Studies at the University of London. His Anyon Kunche inaugural lecture, A State of Our Own, Second Independence, Federalism, and the Decolonization of the State in Africa in April 2014 became the first inaugural lecture by a Nigerian in the history of the University of London. Before taking up appointment at Okada, he was leader of the Ford Foundation funded program on ethnic and federal studies and director of the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies at the University of Ibadan. Between 1994 and 1998, he was professor and head of the Department of Political Studies at the University of Transcare, South Africa. He has also been a visiting professor, fellow, distinguished senior scholar at many universities in United States of America, Liberia, Austria, South Africa, Sweden, Northern <laughs> Ireland, University of Cambridge, UK, and a number of universities and research institutes in India. 
He was a Rockefeller Reflections on Development Fellow, 1989-1990, and was most recently a MacArthur Fellow. In 1996, he won the Best Paper Award at the eighth annual conference of the International Association for Conflict Management in Denmark, Professor Osage also won the Best Article Award for 2004 of the African Politics Conference Group, a coordinate group of the American Political Science Association, African Studies Association, and International Studies Association. The same article also won the 2004 Lawrence Dombard Reddick Memorial Scholarship Award for the best article on Africa published in the Journal of Third World Studies. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, Professor Osage served as chair of the Panel on Quality Assurance Assessment, United Nations Economic Commission for Africa from 2011 to 2012, chair of the Pan-African Working Group on Building Institutional Effectiveness in Africa hosted by the Institute for Global Dialogue, South Africa, and Federal Trust Fund, UK. Between 2005 and 2006, UN expert on Somalia from 2010 to 2016, and has been a member of the Technical Advisory Panel and Network on Parliament and Parliamentary Institutions of the African Capacity Building Foundation in Zimbabwe since 2003. Between 1998 and 2004, he was Africa's representative on the steering committee of the civil society and governance project based at the IDS of the University of Success, UK. Between 2006 and 2010, was a member of the Center Advisory Review Group Development Research Center on Citizenship, Participation and Accountability, which was based at the IDS University of Success. He also served on the steering committee of the Consortium of, for Development Partnerships, a successful model of North-South intellectual collaboration that involved institutions from North America, Europe, and Africa between 2005 and 2012. Osage is a member of several learned societies and editors and seminars in different parts of 89, which he edited with Professor Peter Eke, Between States and Civil Society in Africa, 1994. Ethnicity, Class and State Power in Liberia, 1995. Crippled Giant, Nigeria Since Independence. 1998, Researching Conflict in Africa, Insights and Experiences, 2005, a co-edited book published by the United Nations University Press, and Federal Solutions to State Failure in Africa, 2020. In addition, he has published over 150 articles in books and learned international journals. Professor Egosa. Emmanuel Osage is happily married to Dr. Veronica Osage and is blessed with four lovely children and grandchildren. <laughs> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, permit me to present the man of the moment, a seasoned academic, the African voice on decolonization and an ordained reverend of the Anglican Church, Benin, Nigeria. Our convocation lecturer of the 13th Convocation Ceremony of Bell's University of Technology, Ota, Professor Ewosa Emmanuel Osage. Thank you. Your Excellencies, this is how I greet people now. Um, Your Excellencies, um, in particular the incoming Chancellor of the University, 
it's um, a delight that our paths are crossing again uh, in very intricate and interesting ways. I welcome you. Um, the chair of the council, my brother, the vice chancellor, and principal officers of the university. Um, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me say how very delighted I am to be the guest lecturer for the 13th convocation ceremony of Bell's University of Technology. This is Nigeria's pioneer and premier university of technology in the private sector. So it's a delight that we are witnessing what for nearly 15 years has been a very steady part of meaningful, impactful contributions to Nigeria's growth and development in this sector. I'm particularly delighted that it is a convocation ceremony that gives us the opportunity to say things that I hope those who are graduating this year will remember to tell those who graduated before them and those who will come after them about the primacy of science and technology to not only development, but also to solving human problems, both existential and material, um, so that together the contributions of Bell's University would remain permanent. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you. Now, this day I have chosen to talk on an evolving subject which is of great importance to everyone. Today, if you look around, the world, people say it's the age of knowledge. They say knowledge rules the world. It's the age where we talk about artificial intelligence. It's the age where we talk about scientific breakthroughs. It's the age where everything seems to be falling in place. And yet, you will be the first to identify the paradox that the more things fall in place, the more we get perplexed. The more we know, the less we seem to be able to manage what we know. But that is where science comes in, and i like today to share some of the thoughts that I have on this subject with you in the hope that this lecture would help to put in proper perspective the kinds of things that I think we need to do as a people, as a society, as a country, to be able to put science in the forefront of all the things that we're doing and to make it a vanguard of our development process. Now, it is known all over the world, you know, throughout the ages, that science has led the world. Science, and of course, its concomitant variable, technology, has been the eye-opener. It has helped human societies to make progress. It has helped to multiply productivity. It has helped to understand the world in which we live. And the whole point about science is that it is able to subject the unknown to the realm of the known. What science tries to do, therefore, is to domesticate and control the unknown so that we can not only master nature, we can also solve problems that come from the nature in which we find ourselves encapsulated. And therefore, science is very critical to all the things that we do. This is where science has a nexus with diplomacy. Now, you would know, of course, that conventional wisdom re regards diplomacy as something that belongs to the realm of international affairs and foreign policy. And it takes diplomacy to mean the use of instruments that involve ambassadors who are expected to put their wizardry in bargaining and negotiation in such a manner that you can win the war of hearts and minds without shooting the gun. You know, so diplomacy simply means what you are able to do through persuasion, the kinds of things that you are able to do through some kind of influence, what students of international relations refer to as soft power instruments, the kinds of underbellies that would make you not shout, uh, but simply do things that would let the world know that you not only know what you're doing, you have a mastery of what you're doing and you are able to influence how other people think and you are able to extend the frontiers of your national interest. 
This is the essence of diplomacy. And we're simply saying there is an evolving specialization called science diplomacy. And the whole business of science diplomacy is to seek to use the paradigm of science as an instrument of persuasion, as an instrument of foreign policy, as an instrument for achieving the national interest in diverse ways. And this is important because of the interface between the domestic environment and the external environment. In other words, science diplomacy bestrides the worlds of the internal and domestic environment as well as the external and foreign policy domain. What this means is the following, which you already know. With increased globalization, the nation state has become the international society writ in large. You just think of it. There is nothing that happens in Nigeria today that does, not, that does not have a global interface. There is nothing that is problematic in Nigeria today that does not have a snowballing effect one way or the other with what happens in the rest of the world. And therefore, science is the one that is able to bridge the gap between the domestic environment and the external environment. And I want to argue in this lecture, if you permit me, that if we have a mastery of science, if we have a control and we're able to make science what I am going to give to it, then of course our strength as a country, both internally and externally, will be enhanced in ways that are beyond the imagination. I want to argue that science gives you and opens the doors for you to be able to solve problems internally and also solve problems externally. And that way, we hope that we can. But key to this lecture is a critical question of why we have remained as a people at the margins of science. Why we have remained dependent on the rest of the world, especially what is known as the global north or the west for our own global development in the area of science. I'd like to begin this lecture with three anecdotes, and I hope these anecdotes would help us understand and place in proper context the points and arguments that I'm going to be advancing in the course of this lecture. The first story comes from Kano, that you all know, in northern Nigeria in 1979. Now, this was for youth coppers who were closing from the orientation camp. Uh, for those of us who have been through the NYSC, you know, of course, that there is the orientation camp, which is to welcome you, and afterwards you get into your primary assignment, um, which is your deployment um, for a job. Now, we kept reminded, uh, never mind that I've been introduced as a political scientist. My children ask me all the time, does being a political scientist now make you a scientist? I say yes. Now, that confuses them because I know they know I don't go to any chemistry lab, I don't go to a physics lab, and they are wondering which laboratory do you use? And I tell them, they themselves are the objects that I study because I am a student and a scholar of behavioral sciences. But you see, if children still get perplexed in 2021, imagine what would have been the case in 1979. Those of us who were graduates of the disciplines in the humanities and the social sciences were considered a little less eligible for those very important primary assignment deployments um, that our counterparts who had studied the sciences, who were engineers, who were medical scientists and so on, were entitled to. And there was a particular guy, you know, who was very distinguished, had a first class honors degree in industrial chemistry. And every time he regaled us with tales of how his discipline was going to lead Nigeria to the moon and take us out of poverty and all of our problems. And we liked to listen to him, even though every time we listened to him, we felt sorry for ourselves that we studied courses that were not so elegant, like political science. I remember also meeting a gentleman far away in the inner recesses of the world who said to me, so what did you study? I said to him, political science. He looked at me in sorrow. 
and said, your parents must be very wealthy. I said, they are not. Why do you suppose so? He says, why would they let you study political science when there are disciplines that will give them money? I said, like, which discipline? He says, you haven't heard of things like industrial chemistry? Now, I felt sorry for him for the reason you will find out shortly. Okay? Now, so here we were in 1979, and it was time to depart from the, um, the, the place and begin to go to your places of primary assignment. Now, two months after we left the camp, the orientation camp, our friend, first class honors degree holder in industrial chemistry, was still looking for a place. And, and this, this baffled all of us. I mean, those of us with lesser degrees were already well settled in. And here is this very distinguished guy, first class brain, industrial chemistry, what Nigeria needs to grow without deployment. So one Saturday, we decided enough is enough. We must go to Sharada Industrial Estate in Kano. If you know Kano, the Sharada Industrial Estate is the, is the industrial zone of Kano. So we said, today we must get a primary assignment for our distinguished graduates. And we went from manufacturing house and industry to the other and called the whole of Sharada Estate. The story was the same everywhere. He was too qualified. They didn't need him. And we, were, we were really angry. It was only at the last part of call that we got the answer to all of these problems. The man told us that you don't understand. All of these factories, all of these manufacturing plants, all of these industries you see are assembly plants. And how do assembly plants work? The formula that they need, the dosages, all of those things, including quality assurance, these things are precast and predetermined. They come together with the assembly. And so you don't need somebody with a university degree to come to mix you know, reagents you know, or anything of that kind. It's somebody who's a journeyman. You know who a journeyman is? You know, some, some run-down journeyman you could find for peanuts, and you place him there. And all he does is to watch that this color doesn't change from light blue to anything darker. If it does, he does, he, he raises an alarm. And therefore, he says, you don't need to go to university for that. So we said, but this is industrial chemistry. I mean, we need research and development. We need incubation. We need you know, people who will lead our future. He says, yes, that's something he thinks we should tell the policymakers about. We should talk to government about. But right now, they don't need graduates. And, and, the, and the, the assembly plants would not do anything with research and development of the kind that we have described. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is the meaning of import substitution industrialization, the one that relies entirely and depends wholly on assembly plants. Okay? It is a disincentive to research and development. For as long as you do the kinds of things that they do or did at the time in that estate in Sharada, where all the assembly plants were package deals from the metropolitan countries in Europe that were the real patents of these, these industrial rights that owned intellectual property and all of those things, there was no room for research and development. That's the end of the first story. Second story comes from Uppsala in Sweden. And this is in November 2019, before COVID came to sweep the world. Now, I was privileged to be at a Tuesday tea. Tuesday tea, Ambassador Koka is here. Uh, yes, you understand Tuesday tea now because this is what you give at the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs. This is where I borrowed it from. Yes, from Uppsala. They have a Tuesday tea, and it's, a, it's an occasion when retired diplomats, retired scientists, and professors come together. They call it the philosophy tea. And what do they come to do with philosophy? They sit down to ensure that the brain, you know, continues to grow and is alive, uh, just to share the things that they know 
and to see how the world of knowledge has changed um, so that they themselves can be part of the progressions in the world of learning. I was privileged to sit next to a gentleman who was very excited to find that I was from West Africa. And, and he told me a story that truly amazed me. He said, you know, a long time ago, um, in the late 60s, late 60s, um, Sweden, along with many other countries in the Scandinavia, had need for coconuts, coconuts. And in the search for the best coconut variety, um, you know, and in such healthy supplies, they, they, they came to Guinea-Bissau. And they then decided that it would be nice not only to have Guinea-Bissau on their radar, uh, but also to move to Guinea-Bissau um, and, and set up a center there, you know, um, an experimental center, an agric center. Um, he, you know, is an epidemiologist and, you know, they, they all went there in turns. But the one he never forgets is that, you know, in the early 1980s, they found a strange disease um, that was beginning to ravage young children in Sweden especially. And um, because they are serious-minded people, they, they, they traced that disease to the coconuts that you know, were part of the components they used for manufacturing some kinds of food. And so they sent them to Guinea-Bissau, um, to that center, um, to go and do research, uh, overcoming research, as you say, problem-solving research, um, to find what was wrong with this disease and how to overcome it. And that's what they did. In doing so, Sweden, he says, raised his voice, not only for the Swedish citizens and the young people, but also for Guinea-Bissau, for West Africa, and for all coconut-producing countries the world over. And he says, that was the moment when Sweden now became a strong player, a strong voice, you know, with a great deal of influence in diplomatic circles that had to do with coconuts. Okay? End of story number two. Sto I hope you are entertained. I, I don't see you smiling. You should smile. These are entertaining stories. And, and actually, Mr. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, you know, we have different traditions and cultures of convocation lectures. In the United States of America, most commencement speakers are motivation speakers. Um, they are people who come to motivate the graduating students. They mobilize them and they tell them, go outside there and fire a wall. They will go and fire the wall. Um, that's how you test the efficacy of the lectures. But we have a different trajectory here. Ours is to see that we can address serious issues you know, during convocation. And that's good, but I would hope that at some point we'd have a hybrid, the one that would allow us also to motivate with the things. What I'm struggling to do is to have that hybrid. If you don't smile, you won't motivate me. So please smile as we go on. Thank you. Okay. Now, story number three. Most recently, I was with an Asian ambassador. And he was telling me how very closely related his country has been to Nigeria. So he showed me several photographs. And the one that struck me was a photograph of a man I thought was, you know, a Nigerian, but who on closer examination I found was actually an Asian like him, dressed in full chiefly regalia, um, the kind that, you know, our chiefs will hear, wear here. And I said to him, what's the story? He said, yes. Um, that is a Korean um, who came and stayed in Ibadan for 11 years. And in Ibadan, he was at the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture, IITA. And what did he do at the IITA? He says, this man, together with two other scientists, found a disease-resistant variety of cassava and, and, and had improved seedlings. And, and didn't stop there, went the way of agricultural extension services, selling these things to local farmers and persuading them and telling them this is the, the way to go. And in return, after two seasons, all the farmers came to the Olubadon to tell him 
This is the miracle we have experienced. This is the man who did it for us. And so they decided to confer on him a chieftaincy title. I'm sure you would say that is a well-earned chieftaincy title, isn't it? Well-earned. You see, there is also room for cultural diplomacy. You see? So, here, the man has become an ambassador of Korea. And he says, even in offices, both in parliament and in the executive, you find the man's photograph adorning everywhere. What is the point? The point is, this is a Korean ambassador in Africa. Now, that's science diplomacy. And what the man has done, because each time they have to say something of relevance to agriculture in Nigeria and West Africa, they put their chief forward. And he's the one that they will listen to. The man is able to say, a car and the people are astounded. He's a chief, isn't he? And he understands all of those things. Now, these three contrasting anecdotes tell many stories about the possible riches, the possible uses, and the possible efficacies of science as an instrument. The one tells us why science is not, because there is very little room for the science, you know, as a paradigm. You have industrial chemistry? No, we don't need you. I don't know if things have changed, because our friend ended up very sadly as a science teacher in a remote part of Kano State, what is now Jigawa State. And that's where he ended, full of regret that he went to school to study industrial chemistry. Now, I sometimes wonder if these things remain the same. Not too long ago, I was part of an interview panel um, for lecturers in agricultural science at the Faculty of Agri. I was struck by the number of people that came for the interview with PhD in animal science. There were over 80 of them, PhD animal science. And from one person to the other, the story was the same, no job, no job, no job. And yet every day we're opening new universities. You ask yourself what that paradox means. But these anecdotes, especially the last one from the Korean ambassador, the scientific ambassador, sent me thinking along many lines of the kinds of things, the kinds of questions that I want to raise here today. Why is it that we are not able to take the original strides and initiatives in conquering the things that affect us most? Why do we wait for discoveries to be made outside of our shores before we adopt them? I'll give you an example. Sickle cell anemia is almost endemic to us. And yet, the cures that we have found have come from the West. We had to send some medical doctors to Switzerland to study stem cell biology and how it could be used for sickle cell therapy. Why? Is it that it's only after breastfeeding has been found to be the best pediatric approach to newborn babies? Is when our doctors now also say, this is the best. Why? Why are we not able to solve our problems? Why, why do we depend? Why are we clients of what you know, people have done elsewhere? Why are we imitators? Why do we mimic? Have we lost our sense of originality? What kind of science can come from a dependent mentality that you might want to describe as a colonial mentality? Let me tell you. Very soon, I'm going to show us why we are so. Because the way we think now is not original to us. We have thinking caps that have been placed on us 
And it is through the lenses of the thinking caps that we see. And all we see is that we are second best. We can only copy. We can only imitate. We can only consume what we do not produce. Let's go to science itself. Now, science, you know, from when we teach it at the elementary stages, we say science is discovery. It's true. Science is discovery. What science does is to refine knowledge, is to replace the things we think, the things we guess, the unknown, with what we can verify as, as facts, as relatively true, true for now, maybe not for all times, but, and we also have rules for showing that these things are true. What science does is to try to domesticate the environment. And that discovery leads us to understand all the things that we are doing. And science promises that if we are able to understand these things and control them, then we have a mastery of nature. We have a mastery of our situation in a manner that allows us to begin to solve our problems ourselves. So science is about solving problems. The more science you have, the more control you have, and the more control you have, the more influence you have, and the more influence you have, the more diplomatic success you have. It just follows true and true. But what is science? Um, very simply put, you know, we would say science is multidimensional. It has so many things, but I would look at science in terms of two related factors. The first is science as method. The scientific method is very different from all other methods of investigation that we know. The scientific method proceeds on the basis of the fact that things just don't happen. There are no accidents in what we see. Um, there are no um, coincidences. There are relationships amongst all kinds of things that they reduce to variables. And these relationships take only two forms. You can only be on the side of being a dependent variable, which is what we want to explain, or you're on the side of being dependent variable, which is what explains you know, the dependent variable. So the scientific method has a number of assumptions. The first is that as much as possible, we must deal with verifiable facts rather than values. So we're not interested in the things that are subjective. We're interested in the things that can be empirically and directly observed, the things that can be measured, the things that can be seen, the things that can be tested. Um, when you say, for instance, and this is what we do in philosophy, for instance, you say the government is just. The scientists will say that's not a scientific statement because to say government is just will take us into many other realms of epistemology that would lead us more confused than when we started. So let's deal with things that are empirically verifiable. So science deals with concept formation. It deals with you know, experimentation. It, it deals with testing hypotheses. It has theories. It has laws. It has explanations. And what science tries to do is to say, why are things the way they are? How come these things, if one happens, the other follows? So the goal of the scientific method is twofold. Science is about explaining and predicting. So the predictive value of science takes the same form as its explanatory form. So in terms of the nomological order, it says, if x, then y. Where x is the precondition for y, and if y is going to happen, y would say, where is x? Now, so x explains y, but x also predicts y. I mean, that's the point. That's the whole point of our science. Um, so if you want to understand what is going on, you adopt the scientific method. It explains and predicts for you. Now, explaining and predicting helps you to reduce the maze of the unknown. It helps you to master the ropes of what things exist in nature helps you to then say there are relationships among these various variables that can be subjected to some certainty. 
And what you find is the more scientifically astute you are, the greater would be your explanatory and predictive potentials. And that's why today, even in the realm of conflict resolution, we talk about early warning systems. For food security, we talk about early warning systems. For COVID-19, we talk about early warning systems. Whenever you see X, then Y is about to follow. This is the power of science. And those who are scientifically astute have a mastery and some relative control. All of this is not to say, of course, that science is infallible. And that's why science itself still leaves room for degrees of freedom. And I make the assumption, which is very key, all things being equal, ceteris paribus. Uh, because science continues to find out that there is a great deal that we still do not know. And so as we make progress, we, we, we are strengthening the knowledge that we have and our capacity to solve problems, but we are also discovering that there is a lot more that needs to be known. And therefore, a former student of political, of, sorry, because everything in my head is political, um, this man is a philosophy, a philosophy of science expert. His name is Thomas Kuhn. He has a book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And he says that the progress of all scientific disciplines is through revolutions. Paradigms come and go. They get overthrown. As we come to discover new things that old paradigms are not able to explain, we come by new paradigms that replace them, and in the course of time become the dominant paradigms in the field, over time, these paradigms also get overthrown and new paradigms come in. He says, this is in the nature of every normal discipline called science. It's a scientific method. It's the one that doesn't have knowledge once and for all. It's a growing and dynamic knowledge. It's open-ended and must admit of the new knowledges and the new discoveries that are there. So you see why science is so fundamental to all the things that we do? Because it says... It hasn't come to the end of knowledge. It continues to seek and refine knowledge that we have. The knowledge that we have today is of the kind that in another 50 years, when medical science would have conquered cancer, our young people, 50 years' time, would say, is this the same disease that killed all of those people? What ignorance could have caused? Because they would have made greater advancements. Now, take COVID-19. We are told now that even with all the vaccines, we still need boosters. It means that we are still finding out a lot more that we'll refine. So maybe in another two years, we'll come to a full mastery of COVID-19. But that's in the nature of science. The second dimension of science is science as subject matter, as substantive science, what you study. And here we'll find that science is very central to all the things that we do in life because scientific disciplines are so numerous that they cover almost the entire gamut of all that will concern human beings and our endeavors. All the things that we need to be secure, all the things that we need for our welfare, all the things that we need to make us make material progress, all of them fall within the realm of science. And so whether it is architecture, or it is medicine, or it is physics, or it is astronomy, or it is um, geology, or it is any of the engineering, or it is space science, whatever it is. All of these things, not to mention are Greek, not even to mention the pretentious ones, those of us that borrow the scientific method and pretend also to be scientists, like the social scientists, we're all there. So we, we all form part of this whole rubric called science. So science is all-encompassing, extends you know, to all possible areas of human imagination, taking us to the moon and to Mars and to Jupiter and to the depths of the seas and the oceans, everywhere. Science is our guide, and um, it, it guides us through and through, through its explanatory and predictive, you know, um, 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 potentialities. But we have said, like Thomas Kuhn, that the end of scientific knowledge doesn't come. It's, it's, it's continuous, so it's open-ended. Uh, just to say that either as method or as subject, societies or countries that have mastered the science the most and are therefore better able to control their environments are those that are described as developed. 
by the same token, those that have not reached the threshold of control and mastery and domestication are not developed. That's the operational definition of development. You know, so if you want to develop, science will become a paradigm for what you want to do. Science and technology, therefore, would follow logically to make you exactly what you want to be. And this is the whole argument. Now, if this is true, and all societies recognize it, why are we at the fringes? Why are we at the margins? Why are we not on top of science as a people? These questions, I'm sure you already know. I'm sure you, you, you're already pondering, you know, this kind of science. When are we going to get there? Why are we so behind? Why are we consumers, as I say, of the things we don't produce? Why would a graduate go to Sharada Estate and be told we don't need you? Why? Why do we have these problems? Now, one view, which is very ethnocentric, is the one that says science, which is predominantly a Western um, um, thing, is, is something that has come through rationality, um, through civilization of the forms that are superior to other forms in the world. I'm sure we all know this. Um, so that even those of us who talk about the Asian tigers and the scientific revolutions that have gone on in the so-called global south also say we know that if we are going to make progress, if we are going to make scientific and technological breakthroughs, we have to borrow technology and science, we have to imitate, we have to adapt, we even have to steal technology. Haven't you heard those things? We have to steal technology. Um, however violently we are able to do. And some people say, you know, in places like Japan, in places like China, you see what they have done is they have gone to the West, they have looked at how these guys are doing their things, they have come back to adapt them. And so there's a professor of agri engineering who went to uh, India for a PhD uh, a long time ago. And while he was there, he told us many, many beautiful stories of how agri engineering was making progress in India. And he talked about integrated technology, adaptive technology. And we were also excited um, because we thought if he got back, that was what we needed. Now he's been back, he's since become a professor, must be over 25 years ago that he got back. Last year, somebody called me and said to me, we are looking for how we can get machines that would help us to crack you know, palm kernels and, you know, do those things. Um, you know, we know that there's a faculty of agri, there's a, a leading department of agri engineering in your university. This is Ibadan, not, not Igbenedion University. Um, so they say, can you get somebody who will do this for us? So I called the professor. I said, finally, an opportunity to, to, to put in practice all those things he told me about India. Then he said, ah, oh, yes, yes, yes. There's a guy on Ring Road you know, he fabricates machines. So you go and meet him. Tell that guy to go to meet him. And I said, Professor, you mean since coming back from India, you haven't found a way to adapt technology? He says, you know, he calls me Brother Sagai, which is where he says, Brother Sagai, we'll talk to you later. End of story. No, no more reference to that. Now, so, you, you know, we, we have come to the point um, of saying, if we are going to make progress at all, we have to adapt. We have to do what other people are doing and, and, and try to see what comes out of that. Part of the problem with that is science and technology come with cultural frames. They come with cultural envelopes. There are attitude, attitudinal behaviors that come with science. If you are not at that level yet you know, of that congruence, with the attitudinal um, 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 environment, you are either behind or you are too far ahead. There is an incongruence in what you do. Now that's the problem with depending on technology that is not homegrown. Um, so so if, if we are not autochthonous, as the lawyers will say, in terms of the kinds of technology that we have, we are likely to either be ahead of the technology or behind it. Now either way, if you are ahead or behind, you maladjust, and what you do is to, is to use 
the technological wonders for disingenuous um, purposes, like Yahoo, Yahoo. You see? So now you understand why Yahoo, Yahoo is something taken out of context. Because the kinds of things that would lead to the ICT revolutions that would make you know, these digital transformations possible, we don't have the cultural frames. Okay? Now that's one explanation. But there is a deeper explanation. There is a philosopher called John Boyd. In 1970, he tried to explain why the Africans are scientifically backward and why we think in manners that are hollow and not exactly problem solving. Now, he said what Africans do is that Africans live within their environment. They emphasize harmony. They don't seek to conquer their environment. Now, let's understand that. Now, he says when Africans have problems, if, for instance, we've been going to a stream that supplies water to the village, and suddenly the stream dries up, Africans are not likely to say, can we find out why this stream has dried up? They would rather go to the gods to say, what have we done wrong? Why are you punishing us? Now, just in case you think this is a joke or that it belongs to the past, if you do what I do with my phone, you'll probably be on some WhatsApp group or the other. What do we find? When they say six people have been abducted on the campus of the University of Abuja, the next comment will be, who did we offend? Haven't you seen it? So when they say robbers have struck somewhere, rather than say, how do we solve this problem? They say, who did we offend? They have stolen such huge sums in Nigeria. The 21 floor house has collapsed. They say, who did we offend? Is this a, a matter of offending people? Or a matter of finding out what we are not doing right? So that we can put proper things in place. So, John Boyd made a distinction between the Aristotelian mode of thought and the Platonic mode of thought. He says for the Aristotelians, the point is about preserving the harmony of nature. The point is about ensuring that there is functionality and that all parts function to maintain the stability of the whole. The emphasis is on the equilibrium of the system. And so, as long as there's no disequilibrium, we accept everything as everything is. But if there is some little instability that creates a disequilibrium, um, we go back to say, what have we done wrong? And, and, and it's usually to find out you know, from the gods and, um, and um, ancestors what has gone wrong. Now, the platonic mode of thought is a little more rational. It talks about the dialectics of the process. It talks about the contradictions. It, it talks about the basic rudiments of the problematization of every situation. He says it is not everything that you see that you should take as given. You must probe it. You must, you must go behind it to find out you know, what, what things propel these movements. It's only when you're able to do that that you can deal with it. Now, John Boyd was saying, we are more Aristotelian than Platonic. And some would say, maybe that is true. That, you know, the African, the Nigerian, the Yoruba man, the Hausa man, the Efik, the Bibio, the Tiv, the Anang, the Ekoi, the Nok, the Ebira people, all of these people. This is the original condition of the African. We can think. But that cannot be true. And how do we know it is not true? Walter Rodney has a classic called How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. And his premise simply is this, that all societies are scientific societies. There's no society in the world that is not scientific. Any society that is not scientific will cease to exist. It will die. And so our Christian societies were also scientific societies. But they grew along the trajectories of their own cultural milieu. They grew along the paths of their own self-determined and mastered ropes of development. Now, at the point where they came into contact with 
the Western trajectory. Walter Rodney says, what happened was that that, that led to a process of osmosis that took away the African trajectories and replaced the African trajectories with the Western trajectories. Now, what does that mean? You now have to embrace a trajectory that you know nothing about. So you are going to start learning afresh. And that is why, he says, from the point of that initial contact, Africa and Africans started to de-develop. There's another famous African cultural scientist called Cheikh Anta Diop, after whom a university is named in Senegal. Cheikh Anta Diop says, development is a process that requires your own initiative. You must have a control of the initiative of your own trajectory. Development is not something that other people can do for you or on your behalf. You must desire it. Ten minutes more. I'll finish. You must desire it and you must do so. So, he says, if Africans are ever going to develop, if they are ever going to be able to use their science to develop, they must redeem. They must decolonize. Decolonize. So the decolonization of science is the foundation of the scientific diplomatic paradigm that we are you know, advocating. Why? Because Czech and Tadiop, who is also an Egyptologist, may appear like it is predominantly Western of the effects of globalization, however taken. All parts of the world have made a contribution to the science and development that we have today in the world. Without, and this is very interesting, Franz Fanon says this, without Africa, there would be no Western development. Without Africa, there would be no Western science and no Western technology. And this is the whole point about why we need to reinvent science as a basis for not only dealing with our problems, but also as a basis for extending our influence both domestically and externally. I close on the note of the anecdotes again. Think for one minute. What would happen if we are able to redeem ourselves and decolonize ourselves from import substitution industrialization? We would need more people studying industrial chemistry who would come and then do for us what many of our young people are beginning to do in the age of artificial intelligence, in the age of fintech. I'm sure you know fintech. You better know the new buzzwords today, otherwise you'll be left behind. Financial technology, that, that fintech, you must know it. All the things about cryptocurrency, all of these things are part of the developments. The tragedy, however, is that they have not been done by us. We are simply, once again, copying things without putting our frame to it. My final word will be this. India, Taiwan, Korea, China, Japan. These countries have all become industrial wonders. They have mimicked, they have imitated, they have copied, they have stolen, they have adapted, but they have done so within their cultural frames that provide the filters for what they take. And you cannot adapt or adopt without filtration. That filtration is the science that will become a paradigm, not only for our development, but also our diplomacy. I thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, permit me to recognize uh,
some dignitaries that came in while the lecture was uh, going on. Let me recognize the presence of uh, Senator Rochas Okorocha, former governor of Imo State. You're welcome, sir. Dr. Sani Jauro, the promoter of the proposed PEM Resource University in Gombe, is here with us. Dr. Babayo Aldo, Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Niger Delta, is here. The representative of the Governor of Gombe State, Alaji Inusa Yakubo. Chief Mike uh, Oha Tome, former Chief of Staff to President Jonathan, is here. Alaji Daladi Halilo, former Secretary, National Judicial Council of Nigeria, is here. Alaji Ali J.C., former member of the House of Representatives, Gombe State. Alaji Sani Sidi, representing DG Nema, is here. Former commissioners in Gombe State, Honorable Damazanu, Hassan Santana, Asabe Baba. Alaji Umar Bello, is also from Gombe State. We have Dr. J.K. Nayejo, former Accountant General of the Federation. Dr. Baba Femi Adenuga is here with us. Hajia Binta Bello, former Deputy Leader, House of Representatives. Haj, Hajia Riz, Riz Ahmed. MD and Chief Executive, ASO Savings. <laughs> Alaji Ahmed uh, Yayari, National Treasurer, PDP. <laughs> so. Chief Timi Alaibe, former MD, NDDC, is here. <laughs> Chief Aige, Executive Director, Coronation Merchant Bank, is here. <laughs> Barista Uche Wigwe, is here. Chief Alali Halliway is here. Chief Basil, Mr. She she uh, Dr. Shewakim uh, Shewo Basanjo is also with us here. Okay, Alaji Sani City is former DG, Nema. The representative of uh, Jam Registrar is also with us here. Mr. Oshusan. Olani. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. I want to thank the lecturer for a very inspiring and um, and I want to thank you also for the privilege today to drink from your wealth of knowledge and experience. And um, we are very privileged today to have you giving the convocation lecture. I want to invite at this point the Vice Chancellor of the University, Professor Jeremiah Oludele or Jediron, as he comes forward to present the gift to the guest lecturer. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, you cannot adapt, adopt without a filter. I have the honor and privilege to invite our erudite Convocation lecturer, you cannot adapt, adopt without a filter. We have, um, on behalf of um, the governing council, senate, staff, and students of Bell's University of Technology, the first private university of technology in this country, we sincerely 
appreciate you. And we were glued to you speaking virtually, almost extempore. Whereas going through your lecture notes, they are just there. The details are there. Thank you for being down to earth. Thank you for giving us the need for a paradigm shift in this country. We need to adapt truly. We must have a cultural filter. Thank you so much and God bless you. This is on behalf of the entire university. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Oh, please. They are still on, sir. As is our culture in Bell's University of Technology, you must take some souvenirs back so that whenever you look at them, you remember that once upon a time you were here. But anyway, you become part and parcel of us. Make this a beneficial relationship, one that is virtually perpetual. Thank you so much for coming. On behalf of Bell's Tech, thank you very much, sir. God bless you. May I also seek the indulgence of this august audience to present some awards to some de deserving students. When the guest lecturer was speaking, he spoke of FinTech. And just to tell you that Bell's Tech has moved. Our students undergo what we call New Horizon Program, ICT program, throughout their four or five year stay in this university. Four of them have excelled, and um, they are to be awarded some plaques today. Um, two of them, not a number two, are on ground today. We have one in computer science, another one in architecture, electrical engineering, and mechanical engineering. When our students graduate from here, convocation lecturer, they must have additional skill, soft skill, that will stand them out, out there. So we make sure that we give them innovative skills that they can employ. I have the honor of calling on Agidi Frederick from Department of Architecture. He has International Professional ICT Certification in Certified Project Plus. Please, could you please come up. The New Horizon, it's a company that gives this certification, soft skill, has given an award to this, and this is um, a part for this student. Agidi Frederick, HOD Architecture, can you please receive this on behalf of your student? Quickly, next to that is Oye Wale Teniola, Computer Science. He has certification in Cisco Satisfied Network, CCNP. CCNP. Oyewole Teniola, Computer Science. It's quickly, Adeye Yadibinpe Oluwa Shiun, Electrical Engineering. Electrical Engineering. And Awata Theodora, Mechanical Engineering. These have Micro Office Specialist Certification. <laughs> Mechanical Engineering.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. I want to invite the chairman of the occasion, the president board of trustees, as he comes up to give the chairman's closing remarks. Professor Bat Naji. You're welcome, sir. Your Excellency, Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, uh, you will agree with me that uh, Professor Osage gave us a lot of food of the mind. We thank you so much. I was uh, thinking about the uh, when you and your colleagues were trying to find a job for that industrial chemist and you searched and searched and you couldn't find and I must tell you it's not very uncommon in our beloved country because a lot of the companies that operate in Nigeria that are conglomerates just use the technology from their nations. The technology will not be open. And uh, so there is nothing to add according to them. They don't allow it. And that's the unfortunate situation. So the idea of conquering the environment as uh, uh, the, the person you were quoting said is very important that we should we do uh, adapt to the environment but that uh, we need to conquer the environment but given I just want, want us not to misunderstand uh, Professor Osage that especially given this uh, period of uh, climate change that he's not saying that we should go and cut down our trees. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, if something is not working, let us try to find why it's not working, but not by going to Juju to find a solution. That's what you're saying, Prof. So we really appreciate you. Uh, you've told us in so many uh, words that science has no boundary. And that's what it is. That we should uh, adopt. Uh, I, given our situation, I say we can even steal. Um, we will use the word uh, adopt for the same thing. Because after all, the whole thing about developed countries, China, relationship with America and uh, uh, Russia is all about this thing you're talking about. So, we just have to become bolder and uh, your lecture is, uh, is very critical. And it also tells us that it's that all of us are together. Science, scientists work, but scientists work with those who philosophize, those who theorize, those who, polit uh, who think politically uh, about how to solve these problems. So um, the lecture is, um, is uh, very well taken. And on behalf of uh, the promoter and uh, the university uh, management, the Board of Trustees and Council, we uh, thank you and uh, we declare this closed.
May I recognize the presence of uh, Chief Akin Oshitoku, former politi political advisor to President uh, Olusegun Obasanjo, who is here with us. I have the honor and privilege to invite the Vice Chancellor, Professor Jeremiah Oludele Ojediro, to constitute this assembly as the convocation of Bell University of Technology Otter for the purpose of the installation of the third chancellor and the confirmation of honorary degree of Doctor of Science, Honoris Causa, on the Chancellor. Vice Chancellor, sir. I hereby constitute this assembly as a convocation of Bell's University of Technology Ota for the purpose of the installation of a third chancellor and the confirmation of honorary degree of doc Doctor of Science, DSC Honoris Causa, on the chancellor. The law establishing Bell's University of Technology Author recognizes the position of the Chancellor of the University. The Chancellor shall, in relation to the University, take precedence before all other members of the University, and when he is present, shall preside at all meetings of convocation held for conf conferring degrees of conferring degrees. The choice of Dr. Ibrahim Hassan Drakwabo, FCA, OON, is made in recognition of his outstanding qualities and immense contributions to the financial, educational, social political development in Nigeria. I humbly invite the university orator to read the citation of Dr. Ibrahim Hassan Drakwabo, FCA, OON. Orator. Standing on the existing protocol, may I humbly request His Excellency, Allah Haji Dr. Ibrahim Hassan Dankwambo, to stand up. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir. Okay. His Excellency, please, can you step forward? Thank you. Mr. Vice-Chancellor, sir, permit me to read the citation of His Excellency, al Haji Dr. Ibrahim Dankwambo, OON, FCA, FCIB, FNES, FNIB. His Excellency, al Haji Dr. Ibrahim Hassan Dankwambo, Talban Gwombe was born on 4th April, 1962 in Gwombe State. Reading his citation can be likened to taking an economic and governance tour around the world, owing to the level of contributions he has made to global economic growth as a chartered accountant, manager, taxation expert, economic strategist, bank examiner, international consultant, and erstwhile governor. As an academic with a very sound background, Dr. Dankwambo obtained Bachelor of Science degree in accounting with second class upper division from Amadou Bello University, Zaria. Master of Science degree in economics from the University of Lagos postgraduate diploma in computer science from Delta State University, Abraka, and Doctor of Philosophy from Ibunedion University, Okada. This tertiary academic journey commenced in 1981 and peaked at doctoral level 
in 2014. This is worthy of recognition and admiration. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, a man of insatiable appetite for learning, Dr. Dankwambo did not relent in his search for knowledge. This led him to enroll for certificate courses, cutting across management, budgeting, financial management, forensic auditing, programming, computing security, among others, at several world-class universities, as well as renowned organizations such as Harvard Business School, Duke University, Stanford University, West African Institute of Financial and Economic Management, Ghana, University of Cape Town, Central Bank of Nigeria, Bank of Canada, International Computer Limited, and several others. <laughs> Deeper exploration into the impactful life of Talban Gombe further establishes that he is in the rarefied sphere of eggheads. He has worked as a consultant with multinational organizations, government establishments, pharmaceutical industries, as well as banks, to include NNPC, Central Bank of Nigeria, NITEL, National Directorate of Employment, Pfizer, ETC. Major sectors where his consultancy services covered include oil exploration and marketing, oil servicing, banking, manufacturing, distributive trade, construction, and finance. Our very distinguished chancellor has also worked with Coopers and Librand International, which is now known as PricewaterhouseCoopers, as well as a chartered accountant, <laughs> where he was saddled with the responsibility of audit planning and control, systems audit, supervision, and coordination of training, preparation of fin final accounts, to mention but a few. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, being a man of many parts and vast experience, his Excellency Dr. Dankwambo earned placement in the membership of the Board of Directors of the Apex Bank, the Central Bank of Nigeria, as well as that of the Debt Management Office. This feat is not for the feeble-minded. I think he deserves an round of applause. In recognition of his intellectual sagacity, Dr. Dankwambo has been appointed to serve in several capacities on high-powered committees, both at state, national, and continental levels. These include President, Forum of Accountants General and Auditors General in West Africa, Pro Temps Executive Secretary, Forum of Accountants General and Auditors General in West Africa, Chairman, Review of Financial Regulations and Other Financial Laws in Gombe. Co-Chairman, Standardization of Federal, State, and Local Government Accounts in Nigeria. Member, Year 2000 Millennium Bulb, Challenges and Implications. Secretary, Computerization of Money Laundering and Surveillance Units. Sub-Chairman, Review of syllables for bank examiners training. Member, Central Bank of Nigeria, Nigeria Deposit Insurance Corporation, Joint Committee on Bank Analysis System, BAS, Computerization Project. Member, Standardization of Accounting Formats for Banks and Other Financial Institutions Committee. Member, Committee on External Examiners Central Bank of Nigeria, and member, Bauchi State Government Committee on mobilization of other sources of revenue for state government. <laughs> Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, 
going by the pedigree of our very distinguished chancellor, he was appointed Accountant General of the Federation in 2005. <laughs> a position he held until his election as Executive Governor of Gombe State. <laughs> I am delighted to let you know that His Excellency Al Haji Dr. Ibrahim Hassan Damkwambo, OON, FCA, FCIB, FNES, FNIB, Talban Gombe, meritoriously served as the Executive Governor of Gombe State from 29th May 2011 to 29th May 2019. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, our distinguished Chancellor, despite his global outlook, never forgot his roots. He is the Taliban of Gombe, in recognition of his contributions to the development of his home state, Gombe State. <laughs> distinguished ladies and gentlemen, permit me to most respectfully present to you the man of the hour, the man Gombe people believed in, the man who governed Gombe for eight solid years, officer of the Order of the Niger, fellow Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria, fellow Chartered Institute of Taxation of Nigeria, fellow Chartered Institute of Bankers, fellow Nigerian Institute of Marketers. He is no other than the third chancellor of this great university, Bell's University of Technology, Otta. His Excellency, Alhaji, Dr. Ibrahim Hazan Dankwambo. Thank you. I have the honor and privilege to call upon the President and Chairman of the Board of Trustees, represented by the Pro Chancellor, Professor Bart Naji, to formally install the Chancellor. Thank you very much. Most distinguished Dr. Ibrahim Hassan Dankwambo, FCA. OON, do you pledge that throughout your tenure of office, you will faithfully uphold and preserve jointly and severally the statutes, laws, and privileges of Bell's University of Technology Otta without fear or favor? I promise perform my duties faithfully and diligently as Chancellor of Bell's University of Technology, Ota. Thank you. I, Professor Bart Onnaji, by the powers conferred on me to represent the President and Chairman of the Board of Trustees of Bell's University of Technology, Ota, Hereby formally install you, Dr. Ibrahim Hassan Dankwambo, FCA OON, as the third chancellor of Bell's University of Technology, Ota. I heartily congratulate you and wish you good success.
Come at one or anything.